Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. I spent some time with my colleague Bert Laverman talking to him about how to set up Axon Server. But we also discussed in lots of details about architectural concepts such as domain-driven design, microservices, CQRS, and more. This talk was divided into two sessions. I hope you enjoy it, and let's have a listen. Hi, Bert. How are you today? Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, you too, and thank you. Good morning. So I've been wanting to talk to you about some really interesting stuff for a while. So thank you for giving me the opportunity today to discuss so many wonderful and interesting things. So hopefully I have enough time to cover everything, but if not, I'll come back and talk to you more, some more about <laughs> some of these topics. Perfect. So before we start, let's, uh, if you don't mind, share uh, some of your background, education, work experience, and also where you're located at. Okay. So just for the record, my name is Bert Laverman, and uh, I'm a software architect and developer at Axonic. Um, my background, well, I was born in Rotterdam, but generally I say that I didn't uh, stay there for more than half a year, although, of course, it was my parents that moved. And eventually they settled in the northeast of the Netherlands. So I grew up and for Dutch reference, far away from Amsterdam and uh, went to school there. And then uh, during school, became interested in computers and started computer science study after school, which makes me uh, in the Netherlands, at least part of a minority in the sense that I'm a real informaticus, as you would say. I'm uh, one who is formally trained in computer science. Very good. And so prior to going to university and studying mm -hmm. computer science, did you have any interest in working with computers and sort of picking apart pieces of <laughs> hardware and stuff like that? Or was well, it just something that you became interested in college? Um, no, it uh, actually, I wasn't interested in computers that much. I didn't know anything about computers apart from having an uncle who worked for IBM, but I didn't know much about him. And somewhere during my fifth year at high school, I started noticing that there were some shops that were starting to put up a microcomputer there. And I got to talk to someone who was doing stuff on it because, of course, the shop owners didn't know what to do with those things. So they just put them on the bank right. up there and let, <laughs> and let customers play with it because hopefully right. you'd get a customer who's so interested he wants to buy one. Mm -hmm. And... And so time-wise, well, when was this around? Was this like in the 90s? No, or? no, this was the beginning of the 80s. So, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And that I still, I think I still have a piece of paper somewhere safe, kept safe of the first program that I typed in into one of those things, which was kind of a snake game, oh which was quite yeah. fun. That would be fun to, if you can find it. And yeah, I would love to see that. That's really interesting. Yeah, stuff. but it's, uh, I mean, so at that time, computers were so uh, absolutely incompatible across brands that it is inconceivable for most people. Nowadays, you think if it's a PC, it's a PC. I mean, then it runs Windows, right? I mean, well, we have got Macs and Windows, but I mean, that's about it at that time. Even two different computers from the same maker would be totally incompatible. Incompatible, yeah. yeah. That is fascinating mm -hmm. and interesting. Yeah. yeah. So when you were in um, then university and became interested in computers and uh, decided to actually study computer science, um, did you then decide to go the route of programming and development, or did you then decide to become a software architect from the beginning? No, that was initially uh, all about uh, programming. I mean, I liked programming. By that time, I had my own personal computer and uh, was doing a lot of stuff on there. And I went to a technical university, and that was, I think, just two years after they started having computer science as a separate discipline. So wow, they were okay. still kind of coming to grips with it, which means 
for or meant for the students at that time that you would get quite a lot of uh, mathematics and electrical engineering because that was where it came from. And I went immediately for kind of low level playing. So doing things like assembly language, operating systems and that kind of stuff. So that's really, really fascinating. So speaking of operating systems, you you do a lot in uh, terms of operation. And as, as we speak to also in Axonic, can you tell me a little bit about the history of that? Because we had a little chat last week and you were telling me about the Linux and what you did prior to that, which was Minix. So can you talk a little bit about that and tell me a little bit. Well, at a certain moment, computers or the, those personal computers starting to becoming strong enough and, and good enough that you could use something like Unix on it. And there was a professor in Amsterdam who wrote Minix and was not entirely giving it away free, but I mean, it was just something like a uh, hundred dollars, I think, something like that, buying the book plus the copyrights and a set of floppy disks. And I started playing with that, and I found that so much fun that I just went on with that. And then I actually wanted to be able to just leave the thing running because that was what you did with the server. And a number of years later, I actually, with a group of friends, started a foundation to allow people in the north and east of the Netherlands to have live internet because at that time, live internet meant dial up. Now, in, in the US at that time, doing a local call was cheap or free. In the Netherlands, it cost money, and inter, inter, how do you call it, um, long distance was even worse. So, I mean, going live on the internet was an expensive thing. And that's what we worked, on, worked for. And I was kind of a co-founder of an ISP, you could say. That's amazing. Oh, I'm sure there are so many stories on, on that topic as yeah, well. That's there's a lot really, of, really I mean, I don't, don't get me started because there were so many things that happened at that time. But we were pioneering that road in the Netherlands. <laughs> that's really cool. So speaking of servers and running your own server, you still do run your own server. Yes, absolutely. So what's, what's the reason behind it? Because nowadays it's so easy and sort of cheap to get a server somewhere else, like sort of have a virtual server. So why do you keep your own servers and what kind of benefit can it provide to you or to anybody yeah. who's interested in doing that? Well, yeah, initially it was just because, I mean, if you want to do something like provide files to the rest of the family, everybody has their own PC and you want to have a central server, then you have to build that server because you cannot buy something like that. Nowadays, you can buy them. You can just get a NAS and hook it up and forget about it. But I mean, if you want to run your own website or have some, I mean, if you're enthusiastic about programming, you want to write a program, a server program that is there and that can be accessed from anywhere. So you have to have something that keeps running. And I mean, Linux is a lot better for that than Windows has always been and still is. So that's why you run your own server. My experience with computers is, is a bit different. So having your own server and running your own server is, is really interesting and uh, something that if I get around to doing so in the future, I'd love to play around with. So that's really cool. So now let's... Uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about software architecture. Mm -hmm. I understand you did work as an architect for a long time. What got you interested in uh, becoming a software architect? Well, software architecture is mostly about how we write software. So as soon as you're interested in the fields of IT surrounding development, like operations and a bit of hardware, and a bit of uh, interconnection networking technology, then it, I mean, it comes natural to start worrying about those aspects when you write a piece of software. And that automatically brings you into the field of software architecture. So for me, that was something that I grew in quite naturally, actually. Was it more of uh, in terms of personal hobby and things that you were doing personally uh, that got you more interested in thinking about different aspects of designing a system? I think the first time I got the label of an IT architect 
that was actually from the company. I worked for a small Dutch company, which was acquired by a large American company, at least for Dutch standards, a large company that was Perot Systems. I don't know if you remember somebody called Ross Perot, who tried to become the president. He acquired uh, a, a lot of uh, companies across the world. And the one that I worked for, Silogic, was one of them. We became Piro Systems Netherlands. And he was, and of course, as a consequence, the company got restructured. And they were looking at, so what to do with consulting? What type of guys do we send out? And the people who were looking across software development and what else do we need to get this to work at the customer side? Those were the architects. And they asked me, do you want to be in that group and become an IT architect? And I thought, yeah, sure, that sounds fun. Sure, why not? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so talking about different software languages that you've worked with, I know you um, always like to explore new things mm -hmm. and try your hands at different different languages. But you are primarily a Java developer, correct? Um, yes, at this moment, that is so. Was it also something that happened by choice or was it more of a career move for you? Um, no, it's more of what kind of projects do you get selected for? Sure. And I mean, my, my start at the academic level was as a compiler builder. So programming languages is something that is very dear to me. I like to try out new languages. And that tends to put you into projects where they use new environments and new languages. But at a certain moment, Java was the enterprise language next to, say, the Microsoft world. And we didn't do anything in our company, or we did do very little in the Microsoft-based development. So it was Java. And that made me a Java programmer. <laughs> which, which I think was the in in some ways I think in my opinion is a, is a good choice because Java is such a stable and powerful language. So it, I guess it's it's nice to have this really great knowledge of uh, this programming language that's still what like fifteen years after the Java one came out, it's still going strong and um, it's mm -hmm. used very widely, which is um, really great. So moving forward, you did at some point come across microservices and uh, mm -hmm. domain-driven design. Let's talk about that. How did you come across it and how did you gain some experience with that? Yes, well, the microservices came first, which has to do with working as a software architect at an insurance uh, company because I had to uh, keep looking at uh, new developments and try and find whether or not they were relevant for the company, if we should look deeper into them. Mm -hmm. And microservices became all the rage. Right. At the same time, of course, everybody knows about Netflix and Netflix has this wonderful microservices architecture. So everybody was saying, should we be more like Netflix? And generally, the consensus among software architects, or at least in the, the ones that I knew, was, well, you can do that if you want. And if you okay. want to fail fast, then just <laughs> use the, the Netflix architecture and then right. try to survive with it. Because as, a, as, a, as the way I've, been, I've grown to see it, the microservices architecture is more the result of other things than it is your first choice. It, you shouldn't say, I want to do microservices because that is the way to go. There's no reason to do microservices. Generally, it is uh, what drives the thing like size of your components should be much more the way you develop software and the way you want to roll out that software in your organization. And I'd like to, nowadays, I'd, I'd just like to uh, summarize it in the form of saying that what you want for your company is what we what we have grown to call business agility. You want to be able to switch your company quickly towards new directions and try to apply new technology. And at the same time, most larger companies have this problem where they have the the one or two deployments every year that the company grinds to a halt because everybody has to help and check whether the new version will work. Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> yes. So 
that is a problem that we've been kind of developing for ourselves. We've been doing it to ourselves. But if you want to change that, then you have to go for agility. And that's also on the software side. And agility doesn't mean I'm only going to make small changes. Right. You want to make changes that you can deploy independently. While at the same time, we've been busy tying everything together. We got this big ball of mud and connections are going everywhere. Yeah. And that's what you try to break down. And then suddenly you notice that you can do this, but you have to go for small size. And hey, that sounds familiar. Yes, then you go towards microservices. But I mean, there's a side to microservices, which has to do with quality. That is a definite problem because if you have small components, it means that small component can fail. It's not the big application that can fail. It's all those small components, which means that you've got to watch a lot of places where things can go wrong. But then at the same time, I think the benefit of it is that if these small things are, for whatever reason, malfunctioning, then... Of course, there are a lot more small things that you have to keep an eye on, but at the same time, it's not going to break the entire system. No. So you if can you go right, to those yeah. systems. Right, if you do it correctly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, but there's always that that danger of doing it um, wrong or interconnecting too many of these small things together where then it becomes a, a sort of like a, a tangled up yarn or something like that, that you can't even untangle it no matter what you do. Then, mm -hmm. then, you, then you're in deep trouble. Then you have to figure out somewhere, uh, some ways to, to get out of this. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that the uh, company where you worked at at the time, where you became more familiar with microservices and mm -hmm. the idea that was behind the design of Netflix was an insurance company. So without going too much into the, too many details of the company. What were some of the real life usages of microservices that you came across that you thought, okay, maybe we can break the system down into these parts because that makes more sense to have them in smaller chunks? Well, if you have an insurance company, at least in the Netherlands, then that probably mm -hmm. means that somewhere in a basement, there is a mainframe right. and it's probably running pieces of COBOL. And mm -hmm. there are probably dates from the 70s on the source code there. <laughs> so, oh man, <laughs> if you want to go from there to a modern web front side, mm -hmm. then you have to put something in between. And mm -hmm. that is where you start cutting and start to uh, make uh, the small parts in between. And initially, what you do is you generally put in cache layers and you start going for asynchronous communication. So you're going to go for communication where you're not dependent on getting an answer now, which is quite uncomfortable for mainframe developers because they're saying, I mean, the system can go down. So you, it, it's, it's impossible to fail. So you can wait for the answer. Right. But, yeah, then they find out that no, there are always ways that it can go wrong. So let's put something in there. And because everybody is using the same system down there in the basement, we don't, we don't want to wait all for it. And then you start using technologies like CQRS. You're going to split up things like the read side and the write side and separate them. And initially, you do it just by putting a cache in there, and then you start finding the problems in keeping that synchronized. And that is when you start trying to use um, uh, technologies like CQRS and microservices for real, because you find out that uh, you've just been trying to well, kind of paint over it, which is what you shouldn't do. You should really do architecting there and, and find a good solution. Dissect it a little bit and see what's going yes. on inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a, so, it's a very scary change for a lot of yeah. companies. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And I was going to ask you, I had a conversation with uh, with another guest last week, actually, with Andy Whitaker, who has done some several projects where he had to basically move from a legacy monolith system into microservices. And of course, the challenges that come in the uh, the process of doing so. And 
but not only uh, in terms of the system itself, but also in terms of uh, your team and whether or not they are resisting to the idea of moving towards something different and something new mm -hmm. and something that in a lot of ways is more complex, but we hope the end results would be a little bit nicer for everybody. How was your experience moving from this legacy system that some parts of it came from the 70s <laughs> into microservices? And with the team that you worked with, did you all feel like that you were all on the same page when you were going through these changes or was it a lot of convincing involved? Well, of course, initially there was a lot of skepticism involved because they couldn't believe that you could do something different and new and then still improve the quality of the code. So one of the things that we did was was kind of a dirty trick, but it worked nonetheless, was introduced a tool called SonarCube. I don't know if you know about that. SonarCube, can, it can read a source code and then do an analysis and tell you a lot about what the uh, potential problems are in there. It's quite good. It's kind of like a compiler because it has to analyze the source code and try to find flows through it and then say, hey, did you know uh, there's this parameter coming in here and then further down there, you're using it and never have you checked whether or not that parameter actually has a useful value. So we started introducing that. And of course the Java guys, uh, there was a, a Java team, they immediately started using it because, well, they were already using those kind of tools. And then we said, hey, we're a big company, we can afford it. We also paid for the COBOL attachment to SonarCube. Nice. And okay. they were like, okay. I mean, I've been a senior developer in COBOL for 30 years. How can a piece of software tell me something I don't know myself? I don't know, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then two weeks later, I met the team leader of that team and he said, mm -hmm. well, they're actually now finding stuff that's been in the source code for tens of years and years. nobody yeah. never knew that. Oh my God. And then they started opening up to the idea that maybe there were some improvements possible. Yeah. And a very, another very interesting story I had with, with a developer, one who was just a few years away from retirement. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the way that mainframe software is developed and especially structured. Right. And I explained to him that there was really not that much difference between that structure and, for example, mm -hmm. a microservices architecture based on event-driven architectures. Right. And he was kind of going, hey, really? Are they using that? <laughs> well, maybe they should ask us to help then because... We know a lot about that kind of architecture. We were doing this years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a new language, but you're mm -hmm. using the same kind of architectures because yeah. you're doing a lot of asynchronous communication. And that's what those guys know a lot about. Yeah. And it's really interesting what you mentioned uh, reminds me of a conversation I had with Rebecca Wirth Sprock. And mm -hmm. she, of course, introduced the uh, notion of RDD and helped in the transition into DDD and working with patterns and so forth. And of course, she's been in the field for uh, a long time as well. And when we were talking, she mentioned something similar to what you were saying about your colleague retiring and sort of having this conversation that some of these patterns, some of these architectural decisions that are being made and talked about a lot these days, they actually existed a long time ago and they've been in practice for a long time. It's just that mm -hmm. somewhere along the way, we stopped doing those uh, good practices that we had initially and made things in mm -hmm. a way, in trying to make things a little bit simpler for ourselves, we actually made them more complicated. So now we're kind of coming back to the basics and pulling things apart a little bit and thinking, okay, how can I make this system more um, manageable, more digestible for um, everybody who's working on this project, on this application, which is really, really interesting stuff. So not to go too far from this topic, but let's, uh, let's move a little bit forward in uh, terms of your uh, next career, which is your current career <laughs> in Axonic. And how did you come to know about the, the company? Did you know about the framework ahead of time? And also you 
do work a lot, I think, more closely with the server as opposed to the framework. And what was that transition like and what made you sort of excited about it? Okay, well, I learned about uh, Exonic from uh, a former colleague of mine who worked for Exonic at that time. And I had seen him on uh, the yearly Java users uh, group conference. He was uh, giving trainings. So I had heard about it and I had looked about it, but I was very much focused on the, the company I was working for at the moment. So since they weren't doing anything in that direction, we kind of left that. But he said, maybe coming to work for us is a good idea because I think we could use you. And then I came in the, and we started looking at Axon Server. At that time, it was still a combination of two programs called Axon DB and Axon Hub. And we were looking at things like testing and quality control. And that was something that I could immediately relate to. And I kind of rolled into those activities before doing actual development inside of Axon Server, which was kind of funny because I've never been forced to actually go deep into the Axon framework. I think for the framework side, I'm still kind of a newbie. Of course, I learned a lot about it, but I don't have a lot of experience using it because I keep doing things on the server side. And uh, you mentioned Axon Hub and Axon DB. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about those uh, two? Well, the company was actually two other former colleagues of mine working. And those were actually colleagues right. from the days at Zero Systems. And one of them, Mark, uh, was uh, working on uh, Axon DB and Axon Hub as being, say, the server components uh, next to Axon Framework. Because the Axon Framework assumes that you have an event store for storing the events. And it assumes you have some way of communicating messages between the different components in your application. And if you want to do an architecture where you have several uh, applications working together, sending commands or sending events to each other, then you need to connect them. So the connection part was Axon Hub and the event store side was Axon DB. Okay. And prior to, basically, from my understanding, combining these two to then come up with Axon Server, mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to use Axon Hub and Axon DB, could they have used it without using Axon Framework? Or were they all interconnected? Uh, yes and no. Yeah, sorry. That's a very popular answer, of course. Of course. It depends, right? <laughs> But the thing is, the interfaces to Axon DB and Axon Hub were from the beginning specified in using gRPC and using protobuf. So a gRPC is the protocol, protobuf is the language that is used to specify the messages that you're sending. And that means that um, if you have a protobuf implementation for your own language, then you can just generate the files from that and then communicate with Axon DB or Axon Hub. The only thing is, of course, it assumes that you're doing CQRS and it, Axon DB assumes that you're doing event sourcing. So you can do it without Axon Framework, but I mean, it's a, a ready-made implementation of the uh, client application side. So then once they joined forces and became Axon Server, now you can use Axon Server without Axon Framework. How easy is that in terms of practicality? Yes, I think still you'd miss the support of the framework, but it is possible. And Mark actually ran some exercises with JavaScript and was able to communicate with it. And uh, Allard actually made a pure Java implementation of the Axon Server connector, which is not dependent on the framework. So if you use that, and so if you're using Java and you're not using the Axon framework, then you can still use that connector and get a connection which allows you to send or stream events and send or send queries and uh, commands. And then it, it doesn't even matter whether or not on the other side, 
there is another program that you wrote yourself to handle the commands or handle the events, or whether or not on the other side, there actually is an Axon framework based application because that is hidden behind Axon server. Sorry. So looking at the flip side of it, if you are using Axon Framework, then Axon Server would be, in my opinion, the obvious choice to use to store your events and yeah. handle your messages. Can you tell me a little bit, what are the maybe a couple of things that make it so much easier to use the two together? Well, the obvious part of that, of course, is that Axon Server was made for the Axon Framework. Yes, of course. And it's then... When you make it, um, you start saying, okay, but let's do it in such a way that if you want, you can do it without. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the way it's done now, Axon Server Standard Edition is, by the way, also open source. So yes. you can download it and look at the source code and use it. Absolutely. Just like Axon Framework. Mm -hmm. And if you start Axon Framework and you don't tell it anything, it will simply assume that there is an Axon Server connection available locally. Mm -hmm. and immediately try to connect to it. Right. Uh, you can disconnect it, but of course, then you will have to provide an alternative event store and sure. alternative connectivity. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it just works out of the box. Yeah. There's not much you need to do. Yeah, which makes life always easier. And I'm all about making your life yeah. easier, which is nice. So mm -hmm. I have highlighted in the past that Axon Frame, Axon Server, excuse me, is a language agnostic. And as you mentioned, mm -hmm. our colleague Mark has worked with a writing program in JavaScript and connecting it to Axon Server. And of course, with Alert and using just vanilla Java. Can you tell me a little bit some, about some of the other languages that we've played around with, or maybe some of the uh, people in the community that have worked with? Well, we know there's somebody who has been working on a .NET implementation, and it's something we're looking at ourselves also. And then, of course, you start with the connector because that is plain Java, and that means that you have something that is already very close to, for example, a language like C Sharp. So it should be quite easy to connect to, to convert the connector to C Sharp. And you can do a comparable thing uh, with the framework. Right. Okay. So that's that's really nice in some ways because it gives a lot of freedom to folks that are not using Java to be able to mm -hmm. use Axon Server for yep. their needs, if whether it's uh, message handling or uh, source storing your events and so forth. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Bert. Please join me next time for the next session of our talk. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.